You're on mute. Who would have thought 12 months ago that we would be saying you're on mute to each other all the time, eh? <laughs> right. Okay, all right, I think we're good to go. Well, thank you all for, for joining me today. Um, this is a, uh, a, a certainly not a, any, uh, any field of um, expertise I've got in at all, really. This is uh, the, the, it's basically we, Chloe and I, I don't know, many, many years ago, we, we set up a crime punishment workshop and I went through the jail registers and just picked out some names of um, uh, individuals to use because we wanted to make it as authentic as possible. And we had a um, we set up like a courtroom experience where one of the students is the judge, and then the rest of, we have ten defendants, and the rest of the class is jury. So and it works really well. It's a good, it's a great workshop. And these two individuals just are picked pretty much by random, really. We were looking for younger people, uh, and people spread across Cornwall, really. You know, geographically spread across. So they these two jumped out at me. The people we're going to investigate later on and look at later on. Um, the the research I've done is. Um, by no way complete at all. It's, it's, um, I've, I've done as much as I can in a fairly short period of time to find out as much as I can about these individuals over and above what we do in the classroom. So there's an awful lot I can still find out. I've found some really interesting, or I think is interesting, stories related to both of them. They're both fascinating. Uh, and hopefully you will, um, you will enjoy it as well as I've done doing the research, really. So um, I think the other thing which, uh, I, I mean, I, I didn't know the, the vast, nature of transportation you know how many people were transported it's it's quite mind-blowing really and also the thing I, i'm quite ashamed i didn't really think about is the effect on the aboriginal people the people we these these european settlers as they were or forced emigrants were sent over to the country uh which you know they they called home for sixty thousand years and you know the the conflict between the two is uh, uh was you know i've really didn't think about before which i'm quite ashamed to say but it's uh it's i brought into focus a bit on this one um transportation is uh, a subject I probably first realised about for transportation when I was a boy and I watched the film Papillon, uh, the true story of uh, Henri Charrier, who, um, who got, he was French and he got sent to French colonies in South Africa and the Caribbean. And he was quite famous for the amount of escapes he did. The, the film's a, a great film, a book, if you haven't seen it before. And also Mary Bryant, who um, you may have heard of, she was, uh, she was called Broad when she was arrested and she was arrested in Plymouth with two others and they were, um, they uh, robbed and violently assaulted uh, Angus Lakeman uh, and they all had a, um, a life sentence put on them which was subsequently commuted to transportation. And she, um, she met on the, she was on the first fleet and when she went out, she met another um, um, man from Foy as well, uh, who she ended up marrying. And they made this amazing escape where they, um, um, took a fishing boat uh, which he was he was in charge of this fishing boat and there's another boats in the harbour so no one could follow them uh, and they did a 3254 mile journey escape uh, to uh, to uh, Timor which took 69 days and saw that was, uh, before she got back to Britain her husband and one of her children had died as well so that's been well covered uh, in the past and also the other famous transportees are the Artful Dodger and Magwitch, um, Charles Dickens highlighting, uh, as he did with lots of things, uh, in, inadequacies in his time. Uh, and there's a great quote here by another uh, reformist, uh, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, he parodies the judge of the time. And he says, uh, I sentence you to what I do not know, perhaps to storm and shipwrecks, perhaps to infectious disorders, perhaps to famine, perhaps to be massacred by savages, perhaps to be devoured by wild beasts. Away, take your chance, perish or prosper. Suffer or enjoy, I rid myself of the sight of you. So this is what he was writing of in in the in the time Jeremy Bentham. So, right. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm just going to run through uh, a little bit about the the how how the cases were were um, tried at the time, and a little bit of background about the the laws, and then we'll go into the we'll have a quick look at the first fleet, and then I'll talk to our two uh, about our two individuals. So, so um, so we got basically we got the, the three tier system. We've got the um, the courts and, and initially were the petty sessions. This is the uh, petty sessions were held normally with two um, justices of the peace. They were held whenever and wherever was necessary. They really looked at cases of petty larceny, so things less than a shilling. The shilling was a key um, financial limit where, where the, the, the uh, crimes were, were tried on, really. Uh, and they were, um, 
um, as based on the old hundreds, really, the old, uh, the old hundreds that set up in Saxon times. Uh, to find out about these cases, it's quite, it's, they weren't really well covered very well in the newspapers because of their, um, you know, the way that they were set up quite quickly and randomly. Um, but you find stuff in the newspapers about these. So if you want to find out more petty sessions, the, the newspapers are the place to, to look, really. Uh, and then the next tier up really is a quarter sessions. Um, we hold at uh, Crescent Kerno the, um, the, uh, the reports from the quarter sessions and they've all been transcribed as well. So these are all searchable on our, um, on our website. So, um, uh, and again, you'll see, I'll use some of these examples later on as well. But these were, um, these were overseen by a magistrate. Uh, there'll be a jury in this one, but they were normally um, principally uh, middle-class white men with plenty of fixed and movable properties. So the people who really, who were, uh, who were sitting there judging these cases were the people, uh, most of the people being robbed, I think so. And, uh, and so they had a bit of a vested interest in the uh, whole thing. They also, there was a, um, like a local government aspect to the court sessions as well. There was, you know, before the county councils came in, they used to rule on a lot of um, things that happened locally as well. So, and then the next level up is the assizes. Uh, the assizes were held twice a year uh, and they were presided by circuit judges. So judges that toured around the country. Um, the, they were traditionally held at Launceston Castle with the prisoners being um, detained in the buildings inside the Bailey or the gatehouses awaiting trials. Uh, and from 1716, the assizes were held in Bodmin. Um, so I don't know, they must have uh, upgraded the A30 or something there so they could judges could move further down to court. It must have been a, a real pain for people at Penzance to take people to, to Lanson to be, to be tried. But uh, in the old Friary Church, uh, and in 1838, the new um, courthouse was, uh, was built, which still stands on the site today. So um, the jail was also built around that time of between 77 and 78, it uh, opened in 79. Uh, and it was upgraded in 1855. So, you know, it was all, all, all close in one site really. So, uh, and until, um, the, and these would have held the, uh, excuse me, let's start for a minute. These are where the, um, they, a step up from the quarter sessions, if you like, with the, uh, the judges. So the more uh, serious cases would have been held here. Uh, and the last, the only other court that was running at this sort of time as well is the, uh, the, um, church courts that were held until 1858, but they didn't preside over criminal matters. They were just dealing with subjects such as probate wills, granting administration, defamation and divorce. So that's the, um, that's the, the court system. Um, the ultimate punishment obviously is uh, execution or death by hanging, as I said. So um, uh, around about the 1750, uh, up until the 1750s, about 70% of those people given the death penalty were actually executed. But by the time the first fleet sailed in 1789, and that was down to about 30%, so a lot more people were being reprieved and, and held in, on, on other, um, normally in, in prison hulks, which again we'll cover in a moment. Um, and at this time, there were 200 crimes which carried the death penalty, the so-called bloody code. Uh, and this shilling was the, uh, the shilling was the key thing, anything over any damage or anything stolen over the value of a shilling. Um, was um, seen as a um, as a capital capital offence, and the death penalty would have gone gone with that. Um, and uh, the idea of moving criminals out of the country goes back to 1597 to the uh, Punishment of Rogues, Vagabonds, and Sturdy Beggars Act uh, in the time of Queen Elizabeth the uh, First, and a colony was set up to receive those banished um, in 1607 in Virginia. Uh, the introduction to the American colonies and and incarceration on prison hopes absorbed many of those who had formerly been hung and uh, met the gallows. Um, but most of those, these were freed by the, from the death sentence by something known as royal prerogative mercy. Um, before the, the transportation to America was regularized in 1718, the monarch would decide on each and individual case. Um, after this, the secretary of state decided them on the monarch's behalf. And from 1823, the judges in the courts were allowed to um, to commute these sentences, the death penalty to other sentences. So uh, and as, as time has gone on, it's, it's come down to the level. I think both of the ones we're looking at would, would have, could have been done in the court case. Um, prison hulks were um, uh, basically mostly retired and Royal Naval ships. And they were at Plymouth and at Portsmouth. Uh, and uh, there was a hulks act that was introduced in 1779 uh, prisons were just full and they just needed to put the prisoner somewhere else because the mainly because of the um, uh, after we lost the uh, the American colonies um, in the, uh, the war of independence there was uh, we couldn't send them anywhere so they were they were kept on these um, hulks 
Um, in 1786, there's a record of a, a, a riot on the Hulk in Plymouth, which saw 44 of the convicts on there actually injured with gunshot wounds um, given by the, um, by the, the soldiers who were based there. Uh, of which eight of them died. So things were quite grim on these hulks, very, very grim. Uh, you know, it, it was, um, it was um, really quite bad. Um, so from 1783, they had to um, start looking for somewhere else to, to, send, uh, to send people. Um, and they, um, they tried uh, sites in, in Africa, South Africa, uh, and, and slaving stations. It didn't work. They've set, up, set, set them up in Gibraltar, um, um, Bermuda, Singapore, and India. In fact, anywhere in the growing empire where labor was needed. So they, uh, they tried it around. I'm gonna slide back in time. Oh, sorry, let's just have a look at these. I mean, this, this is actually, this is, this is Plymouth. Um, I've, I've done a bit of censorship on this one because of the, um, um, there may be children watching because it's half term. So, but this, this is actually, uh, this is apparently on Plymouth docks uh, and it's a, uh, it's black mold she's called and she's saying goodbye to her husband and her friend who are being sent off to the hulks in Plymouth. These are apparently in uh, Plymouth and there's Millbury Jail as well there, which was on the site of really where the, um, where the ferry leaves now, I believe. So in that area there. So, so, um, so these, these hulks just filled them up. So going back in time, uh, again, back to Plymouth again in 1768, Endeavour set sail from Plymouth under the command of James Cook. Uh, and he, um, he's, sorry, that phone ring is my wife. We should know that I'm in a meeting. <laughs> he did that, so got on mute. That buzzing is, is, is her. So, um, she, uh, and so he, he um, New Holland had been discovered, but he actually mapped the Eastern and Southern aspect of it. Uh, and he, he called, the, called it New South Wales and he, and he um, claimed it on behalf of Britain, basically. Uh, they went to, they made landfall in Botany Bay uh, which he um, they was named after the, um, the, the vegetation that was there uh, and uh, came back and told everyone about it. And um, when he came back, the Home Secretary at the time, Lord Sydney, uh, obviously the, what, what the colony was named after, um, charged his undersecretary with the implementation of a policy to establish a penal colony there. His name was uh, Ivan Nepa, uh, Nepin, and he was a 33-year-old from South Ash. So there's, there's quite a few links to people from Cornwall who actually were there setting up the colony and he had a, a, a he had a river in the colony named after him so I've probably pronounced that totally the wrong way but someone can, can pick me up on that later please that'd be fantastic and then from from this day onwards the transportation of to New South Wales Van Diemen's Land or one of the islands adjacent via two or to places beyond the seas were recorded the sentences um, across the country okay so the first fleet um, um, sailed from the colonies on four o'clock in the morning on Sunday the 13th of May 1787, so a journey which would take eight months. Um, after that fleet left, about a quarter of all felons convicted in England, Wales and Ireland were transported, uh, and about, around a fifth of these died on the journey. So the, the, the death rate was quite astounding, really. So between 1787 and 1868, just under 170,000 convicts were sent to Australia and Tasmania. From Britain and Ireland on approximately approximately 800 separate voyages. It's you know, vast. I really had no idea that it was such a such a, a, a huge huge uh, movement of people. Really. Um, so the journey they took on the first fleet, they um, they arrived in Tenerife on the 3rd of June in the Canary Islands, and they took on fresh fruit and water. Then they set off for the uh, Cape Verde Islands, but they couldn't land there. They got there on the 19th of June. They couldn't actually land on the islands because of the uh, adverse winds and conditions. Uh, and, uh, and subsequently, they've got caught in the, um, uh, in the doldrums uh, and they had a huge amount of cases of scurvy because they couldn't pick up the fresh fruit and vegetables. So they arrived into Rio on the, um, the 19th, uh, oh, sorry, on the 6th of August, and they stayed for a month. I mean, there's some... Um, and there's 1,500 people on this voyage, so I just it's mind blowing really to think that they they can arrive in Rio with all those people and then feed them and and, and put them up for a month while they're at the criminal state on the ship, uh, and they took on again fresh fruit and water and provisions for the next journey, which was across to the Cape of Good Hope, um, and that um, they arrived there on the 13th of October, again staying for a month picking up provisions and they they bought uh, livestock here as well. So a quick look. Um, um, not only for the journey, but actually to um, keep them going for um, at least six months in, in, uh, in the new colony. So they 
it must have been pretty chaotic on these uh, on these on these boats. Uh, and then they uh, on the last leg of the journey, they arrived in there on the 19th of January into Botany Bay after 252 days uh, and 15,000 miles. And no vessels were were lost, but 48 people died on this on this journey. Um, so they arrived in Botany Bay and they had a look around and they decided this wasn't the best place to um, um, to set up colony at. The, the, although Cook made uh, big things of it, this, the soil was very sandy uh, and they were um, they were exposed to gales. So they did an bit of an exploration and they worked their way up the coast. About seven miles north is Port Jackson, uh, and that was named by Cook. And they they went into the estuary of Port Jackson. Uh, and they found a, 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 a place and which they named Sydney Cove uh, after the Home Secretary, as I mentioned earlier. And then the, um, the colonies run, the, the colony was, was set up really. About 10% of all the people on that first fleet, criminal wise, were from Devon, Devon and Cornwall. Just the last bit on this, this really. This is, this is um, Captain Arthur Phillip. He was the, um, uh, the, the project manager, I like to call him, really, of the whole First Fleet exercise. He ended up being, he was, a, he was the governor, the first governor of the colony, uh, and he really project managed the whole thing from the beginning. So he had a uh, complete hand on the budget. He um, commandeered the ships. I think three of the ships were Indian men who actually went on to get pick up tea and come back after. So he was trying to save a bit of money that way as well. Uh, and also he... Um, laid all the crew on himself and organized all the provisions and the rationing while they were at sea. Um, so I said that, you know, a, a few people died on that voyage, but at, subsequently after this, they were totally contracted out to third parties. So, um, and there's just a record of poor management of rations, the convicts in clue, crew and the, the, the quality of the medical staff, which would look, um, look after them. On the second fleet alone, nearly a, th a quarter, 273 people died before reaching Sydney and 486 were, of the remaining were hospitalised when they got back to when they got to the colony, with only 316 being fit for work, uh, and um, 124 of those hospitalised died in the ensuing weeks as well. So, so the colony was the colony was really just taking on taking on sick people that came through. So, so Philip did a fantastic job really with his um, his aspect of it, but the rest of it were just the government were really quite shoddy there doing that. And then they really once they arrived at the colony. Um, well, once they arrived into the uh, Sydney Cove, they had to build a colony. So they had to build houses. They had to, uh, and most of them were just shacks covered over by bits of wood. Uh, and there was also um, um, misdemeanors were punished as well. And, and the, um, it was a, the, the, what they decided to do, I'm not sure if they did this before or after, they decided to set up a, uh, another penal colony um, within, uh, within a penal colony, I guess, really. And uh, the um, uh, Philip... Philip Gidley King, who was born in Lanson, he was uh, sent out to Norfolk Island to set up the colony within the colony, uh, and he took with him some convicts, some females, uh, and um, a, a doctor as well. So they kind of set, they had to set up a, a penal colony within a penal colony out of there. Uh, and um, another person with Cornish connections who was actually on this uh, first uh, fleet was. Um, George Morgan, he's, um, he wasn't born in Cornwall, but he was he buried, he died in Cornwall and, he, and he's buried in Lisgard Cemetery, Lisgard um, St. Martin's Church Cemetery. And there's his grave with his, um, his plaque on it as well. He was, um, he was a musician, magician, and, um, magician, a musician, and he took his piano with him apparently. Uh, and he was, um, he played God Save the King at Sydney Cove on the 7th of February, making him one of the first non-Aboriginal musicians in the, the country. So that's one of the things. But he also kept a fantastic journal, which has been published. Uh, and he um, disguised in quite detail the, the coastline and the flora fauna and the geology. Um, he was really interested in the, uh, the, the, uh, the he pushed back really he was one of the ones that explored what was beyond the actual coastal side of it and he did talk about the native Australians um, who uh, I mentioned earlier lived here for 60,000 years and an attempt to uh, uh, to work or well, to appease them I guess really but these these um, these people would, would not have seen the white man before this cook never came this far the river and they were a separate tribe that were at Botany Bay um, the um, they were hunter-gatherers so they had fixed areas they went to every year and the conflict between them and the settlers was, was quite startling really and I say one thing that I've really 
um, I, I never really thought of before. And it's um, uh, and they, these, you know, they suffered far more than the criminals were sent there, not just through having the land taken away, but also through infections and diseases and uh, and gone down through. So um, it's uh, he, he did record um, the attempt to make friendship. Anyway, let's go on to our two. Um, two people we're going to look at. Um, the first one is, is Mary Lobb. Um, she was um, born in St. Colin Major in 1801 and she, as, as, as I said, I picked her, her at the jail register um, by random uh, and then I did a bit more research into it and actually went back before the jail register on that. So um, she was, um, she was uh, born, as I said, but born in um, uh, St. Column, and then she was she ended up in Red Roof, so she was working in Red Roof. And this is a justice's order there on the left hand side, uh, which we've got in our collections. I found this just by doing a, research, a search onto the um, onto our onto our website, which everyone can do on there. It mentions her and it mentions uh, Anne Paul as well. And they were um, they were being pursued by the uh, uh, by the constable uh, for for theft. Uh, and the the story goes into quite a lot of detail with it and I think that Anne Paul had a uh, access to the, um, the shopkeeper's um, um, bedroom and he kept his money in his bedroom uh, and uh, she had a key and it sounded like they got a copy of the key or, or Anne Paul certainly got a copy of the key uh, and um, she was dipping into it on occasion and buying clothes with it uh, and it seemed like she was storing it in Mary's uh, bedroom and uh, uh, the lady of the house then noticed a pair of stockings were missing. They did a search, realised that the money was missing. There was um, uh, £27, which is about £2,000 in today's money, missing from his uh, his box. Uh, and the uh, and they did search the room and found articles of clothing in Mary's um, bedroom. Uh, and she was um, taken to the uh, to the summer assizes, and she was um, convicted of death. She's. Uh, um, there she is at the top, and the sentence was death. Um, this was later pardoned. So this is um, this is uh, th these are the on the um, national archives. These are Home Office records. And these are searchable through Find My Past. And again, I haven't gone into great um, reams and reams of research on these. These came in quite quite quickly with the, with just doing a very simple search. I d there's no reason that d there's no reason given there why she was um, uh, given a pardon at a later later time. It does say George R at the top there, so I'm not sure if it came down from the king himself or whether. Um, I think possibly someone may have spoken to her because I think it's. It, I mean, reading between the lines of the newspaper story, I think she was probably set up, um, uh, and the things were being uh, the things were being stolen by the other lady and being and and being uh, stored in her room for some reason. So she's almost like receiving rather than um, rather than actually doing it herself. And then this is the entry that I picked up from. This is her in the jail registers. This is um, uh, several, uh, this is 1839 now we're moving on to. Um, and this is really where the, the story gets quite sad. So um, you can see there that she's, um, uh, she's there with a child. So she's been taken into prison with a child uh, and she committed a very similar offense to the, um, to the previous one really in that things were, were found to be missing and then they were found in her, her house. Uh, and she made she went to great efforts to try and get them out of the house before the constable came, but they did find that where they were. And um, she was tried in the quarter sessions. I'll show you the details of the sessions in a moment. Uh, and she was but she was reprieved of um, of receiving them, but convicted of of uh, stealing them. So they uh, went up through, and she ended up the sentence of uh, seven years and uh, one week's hard labour. But also, as you read down through there as well, you can see that she had two other. Um, children as well, three three base children, so um, children that were um, different fathers or had, or had no father. She wasn't married. Um, she had a scar across her right eye, lost an eye, lost lost a front tooth. Uh, in be, in behaviour on the page, you can't see it says that she was orderly, so she was well behaved. And it says her child was sent home by a friend at the request of the mother from Truro Prison on the tenth of April, eighteen thirty nine. Uh, and then the discharge was 17th of April, 1839 to Hindustan convict Hulk in Woolwich. Um, the frustrating thing with this, it does actually mention that she has been in prison before. Uh, and it says, it's in prison before, it's the second time. Uh, and it says C3018 jail. And I've, um, 
luckily for me working here as I do, I was able to go and have a look yesterday because I'm, I'm doing this pretty much on the fly uh, to try and find out if that, just trying to make sure I can tie her up with that first case. I'm pretty sure it is her, it's, it's got to be her really. Uh, and frustratingly, that is it's a gentleman who's in that uh, as 3018. So it was the, um, this is when it was a bridewell, so it's before the jail. Um, but Cena mentions Truro prison in the um, behaviour section as well. She may have been held there. So, um, so I'm fresh that I can't find her. The jail registers, if you don't know anything about these, these are, um, th these are fascinating in that they're so detailed and um, because it's all free, free photography. Uh, and it's a um, gives re it's really really descriptive as you can see there of actually you know whether they can read or write if they're married or single, uh, and um, interesting some of the later ones they actually weighed them when they came in and weighed them when they went out and some people actually put on weight while they're in jail. These again this is our, our cousin kind of website, just put search in Mary Lobin, uh, and these have come out of the quarter sessions um, quarter sessions, uh, which just go over the bits of the case I've said already. And this is the Home Office record, I'm just recording that again, the quarter sessions there. And then the newspaper, I followed up through on the newspapers, my lights have just gone off here as well because I'm not moving around enough. So, um, <laughs> uh, And um, as long as you can see me, I can still see, okay. Uh, newspapers can be searched um, on the National uh, Newspaper Library, which we have, you can use, um, here for free, British Newspaper Library, you can use it for free here in Crescent Kerno and, and Palmer Past as well, and in libraries across Cornwall. Uh, and the uh, it's mentioned to her this this story in here again about this confusing thing where she she goes and grabs clothes and, and runs out the door, and she's actually convicted of st stealing a pillowcase and a pair of bellows, which uh, seems absolutely bonkers, really. Uh, and then uh, again in the Home Office records, it shows her um, on, on the Hindustan. Hindustan, I'm not too sure. This again is another area of research I've got to look into. It's recorded as a um, as a Hulk shift on here and in the jail registers. Um, but in Wikipedia, it says that Hindustan um, was a uh, formerly HMS Dolphin, uh, and it was a Hulk. So it wouldn't she wouldn't have been transported on the Hindustan. She was trans she was went to the Hindustan to go on to Hulk, and then she would have. Um, sailed off on another ship, I think. And then this came up, and this, this really is fantastic because this we've got a, um, a group of volunteers who um, used to meet on the Thursday here, and they went through the Joe Registers and, and pulled out the information I was able to find earlier. But now they're working their way through the poor law records. Uh, and there's a note here, and again, if this wasn't, this fantastic work by volunteers wasn't being done, I, I wouldn't have come across this because there's no way I would have read through all of the poor law records. But this is a, um, I mentioned to uh, the that they, they've received uh, the, the the poor law people have received a uh, a payment of ten pounds, which is about six hundred pounds of today's money, sent home by Mary Lobb, and they're asking what they should do with this money that was sent over. Now, why she was sending six hundred pounds home to St Colum Poor Law, I have no idea. There's no other mention of anything in there. There, there may be other um, volumes I can look at and find a little bit more out uh, to it. Um, it may be that she was sending the money to send for her for them to send their children back because the children would have been taken away from her. Uh, they wouldn't have been transported were there if they were under six. I think they're over six, so they actually stayed on, in the parish. So possibly there's some reason why she's um, uh, why she sent this money back. And then and then fascinatingly, I was able to pull this out of the Home Office records that um, the it looks like the um, the, the poor law people wrote to the um, Home Office. Uh, and she must have mentioned in the letter that she sent that she'd been got married. And this, um, this reply back from the Home Office basically said they don't know, they can't say if she's been married or not. Um, but it does say, interestingly, that she was in Van Diemen's Land, which was later uh, Tasmania. Uh, Van Diemen's Land was set up as a uh, second colony, really, um, uh, later on. And, and they were, um, there were places there called female factories which were really like places of correction. So I guess that she was sent to the female factory and uh, uh, the next chap we're gonna look at ended up on Van Diemen's land as well. He was a, he was a youngster. So a, there's a fascinating story there, a sad story, really quite a sad story, but um, lots more for me to find out really, I think, but uh, hopefully it's interesting enough to, uh, to, to uh, um, maybe make, so you can start looking at your own uh, uh, people. Um, uh, this, this one here, uh, Joseph Verran, um, I've put question marks in there because I'm really not sure about this one. Um, I, I'm not sure about who he is and where he is, but I'm not sure where he was born and when he was born. And you will see why in a moment. So this is where we've picked him out of the jail registers. Um, he was uh, um, 
uh, if, if it was if it was the one in Bodmin, he was baptized in 1825. I don't think he is. But basically arrested in 1840 um, for arson. He was um, an apprentice uh, to a farmer at Wood Hill, just to the north of Liscard, uh, and he set fire to two haystacks and some bags of straw. Uh, again, the, the newspapers go into lots and lots of detail on those. Speak to speak to everyone in the neighbourhood, I think, uh, about it. Uh, and he um, was found guilty, and the sentence was transportation for 15 years. 15 years is a very strange uh, number. They normally use seven or 14, so I don't know whether 15 came into it. Um, and as you can see, they're very descriptive again, what he, what he looks like and where he is. He's very short, four foot five and a half. Uh, but uh, it's, it says about his behaviour, it says he was a bad, a very bad boy, frequently disorderly. Now, if you look at his age, it says he was 13. Um, and uh, 13 comes up in all the official documents, but the newspapers actually had him down as uh, 50. I the, think the, the Royal Cornwall Gazette had him as 15 and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Devon newspaper that had him as 16. So I don't know if that's some, some confusion with the sentence. Um, if it was him, it ties in with the, the chap who was uh, baptised in Bob in 1825, but the official records all say 13. So I think we stick with 13 on him for this one. Uh, and he was, um, he was assigned to go to the York Hulk at Portsmouth. And again, looking at the Home Office records, the, um, the case is recorded in the journal there. Um, and then this turned up. And then, again, this is in the Home Office uh, records. This is a petition. I know Brian Odom's on this talk today, and lots of these names on this list he'll, he will know of and highlight of anyone from the area. Uh, this is sent by, um, look on the left-hand side to start with, this is sent by Charles Buller, who is the MP. Uh, uh, and he has um, obviously requested that the sentence be carried out in this country as opposed to being carried out um, um, abroad. Uh, and, uh, and the names of listers that, that, that have signed this are, are Todd the Vicar, Reverend Anstis, uh, Nettle is a curate, the Mayor, John Allen, who wrote the History of Liscard. Uh, there's um, a Brown Rickard Surgeon, Lyne Charles Sergeant, Anstis, etc. These were all um, key men in, in Victorian Liscard. Uh, and a lot of those were actually solicitors themselves. So, um, but as you can see on the top there, the application was refused by the uh, government, and he was uh, he was um, trans we were sent to the prison York Hulk in the in, in Portsmouth. Uh, and then we got a whole range of records which come up um, relating to. And the one at the top there, I've just pulled out. You can see again, it says that he's described as a very badly disposed boy. Um, but I think the thing that really hits home to these. These, the, the bottom two are actually um, from co called quarterly reports. So they're actually like a roll call, I guess, of the people there and, and how they're, and, and the, and the st stunning thing really, sorry, the stunning thing really with these is that they're, um, a lot of the people that he's with, I'm not sure if you can see the second one, the second one down at the bottom here, but the person who's next to him has been is convicted of buggery with a female. And, and he's just, he's a 13 year old boy in there. There was with these really, really bad characters. So, you know, there's, there's not murders and there's every single thing since. So he was, he was set up in this, uh, in this um, Hulk with these, with these people. He did get um, transported uh, with 185 others uh, on the uh, ship, the Lord Goodrich, and he went to Van Diemen's land uh, and he uh, um, got sent on, 1841 and I know nothing else about him it's a bit like Mary really I, I need to go to look at the Australian records to find out a bit more about him but I think it's um they're just two quite nice little case studies really of um of people from Cornwall who were transported and the horrific stories behind the whole the whole thing really so um I, 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 there's lots lots of things lots of books you can use to research and I've been using to research these uh, there's a there's a, a you know a vast amount of um, literature out there. Uh, a lot of it we again we withhold here at Crescent Corner, which people could access if they if they wanted to. Um, and um, the um, uh, that Van Diemen's woman. There's one book I need to find because it probably mentioned there uh, Mary in there as well. The one in the middle is a quite a, a nice one. I'm not sure if anyone's read uh, Kate Grenville's The Secret River. Yeah, it, but, um, won the Orange Award. Uh, I read it and it's a fantastic story. It's not got no relation to nothing linked to Cornwall whatsoever. Um, but she um, she had an ancestor who was uh, transported and it goes into read detail. It's really there's a nice little detail there about Victorian London and the journey to the transportation journey and actually the arrival in Australia and the conflict that happened there with his uh, he, he was given quite a large piece of land, which uh, um, 
there was not conflict of I won't talk too much, so I'll let you read the um, but but there's there's actually the, the, the searching for is a, like a follow-up to the novel really. So this goes through lots of background information in there about the um about his journey. So if you want to find out more about so transportation, that's a really good place to start. It's quite an, it's a very enjoyable book. And then there's quite a lot of local studies as well. These are two we have here at the uh, and the uh, at Crescent Kerno, um, which you can find out more about people who who left, and and obviously the internet. There's a vast amount of details out there as well, which I'm quite happy to to share these with anyone who wants to, as well. So so as I said before, really, it's been um, I'm 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 on a journey really, and I'm probably not not far off the uh, just leaving the uh, uh, the Canary Islands. I think really with the amount of research I need to do on there, but but an insight into um, into people. Who were transported and the and what they went through. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, stop. I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Should I stop, should I stop sharing my screen, Chloe, or should I leave it up there for a bit? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Stop. Stop sharing. <laughs> right. Okay. There we go.